Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening, everyone. And I am Sachiko Kuno, co-founder and the president and CEO of the s and Foundation. On behalf of the foundation, we are very pleased to welcome you to our headquarters here, the historic Evame Estate, for, the evenings, for this evening's Distinguished Speakers event presented by the World Affairs Council. We are very much honored to co-host tonight's event with the World Affairs Council an organization that works to expand awareness of issues impacting today's interconnected world. For those of you joining us for the first time tonight, today, I would like to express, uh, e explain what we are doing through the Sandal Foundation. The foundation is a nonprofit organization uh, to support uh, talented individuals with great potential and high aspiration in the sciences and in the arts, particularly those with an interest in furthering international collaboration. So we are very much excited about the collaboration tonight with World Affairs Council. I'm very much thrilled to welcome tonight's speaker at EVAME, the Honorable Michael Chadov, uh, former Secretary of Homeland Security. The topic tonight will be very much timely for all of us to build a more resilient nation. President of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., Mrs. Heidi Sharp, join us tonight uh, to introduce Honorable uh, Michael Chartos and speak a little more about the event tonight. Please welcome Ms. Sharp, and thank you so much again for coming uh, to the Eva May for the tonight. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Kuno, Secretary Chertoff, distinguished guests. On behalf of the Board of Directors and members of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Kuno and the SNR Foundation for partnering with us this evening. We are delighted to be here at Historic Ever May and to join with the Foundation to host this extremely timely subject one that is gathering increasing attention, national resiliency. In the coming months, the Council and the SNR Foundation will present programs focused on important global issues. Tonight marks the inaugural presentation of the Evermay series. We are so pleased to have with us tonight the Honorable Michael Chertoff, someone most qualified to address the issue of resiliency. As Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from 2005 until 2009, he led the effort to block terrorism attacks in the United States and transformed FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, into an effective organization following Hurricane Katrina. Before heading the Department of Homeland Security, Mr. Chertoff served as a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third District and even earlier served a decade as a federal prosecutor. Today, he heads the Chertoff Group, providing high-level strategic counsel to corporate and government leaders on a broad range of security issues, from risk identification and prevention to preparedness, response, and recovery. Tonight, he speaks with us on building a more prepared, resilient nation through partnership <coughs> and engagement. He will take questions following his remarks. So if you have a question, please um, use the microphone that's on my right, your left, on the side of the room. Please join me now in welcoming Mr. Michael Chertoff. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction, uh, Ms. Shoup, and thank you, Dr. Kuno, and thank you both for hosting this event. I'm delighted to be the inaugural, I'm honored to be the inaugural speaker of this series, which I think will be a very important uh, part of the public dialogue on issues involving world affairs 
uh, in this, not only in the city, but, but in the region and in the country. Uh, it'd be very hard for me to begin talking about this topic without taking note of the terrible events that occurred in Boston on Monday. And uh, <clears throat> first, let me say our thoughts and prayers go out to those who lost loved ones, <clears throat> those who've been um, seriously wounded and some of whom are in critical condition to their loved ones, friends, and families. It's, uh, no matter how many time the, times these things happen, uh, the human toll is always quite striking. And so it, it's uh, appropriate to give pause for a moment to just reflect on that. It's also an occasion, though, to talk a little bit about the topic of resiliency and partnership. Now, you know, there was an image uh, that was broadcast on television, I think, yesterday. That's the cover of Sports Illustrated this week, and it's a photograph of a 78-year-old <clears throat> runner uh, right before the finish line <clears throat> who had been knocked down by the blast, and there were three police officers running towards him. And I had the occasion to hear this in, in, individual be interviewed on the news uh, yesterday, and he described what happened. He was knocked over by the force of the blast. He was almost having crossed the finish line. And the officers <clears throat> ran to him. One of them helped him up. They made sure he was OK. And then they helped him finish the race. And in many ways, that is uh, emblematic of resiliency. Resiliency is about brushing yourself off and finishing the race. And I, I hope that that image is one that we can uh, keep in mind as we deal with what is unfortunately a feature of life in the modern world, which is not only the natural disasters that we face that are acts of God, but the uh, increasing concern we have about terrorism and man-made acts of terror. And whatever they are, it's partnership that is the fundamental basis for our security. If you go back a couple of hundred years or even earlier, we tended to think about security in what I would describe as a very binary way. Um, there was criminality, there were murders, there were street crimes, and we had police to deal with those things. And then there were wars, and we had our military to deal with those things. And in many ways, <clears throat> there was a sense that uh, the issue of security was left to the authorities, that we were not to really get very much involved in it. Yes, we locked our doors, we might have a burglar alarm, but it was really something that we looked at um, as a, a government function. Somebody else was going to take care of it. I'm not sure that that was ever really true entirely, but to the extent that it was, uh, that all changed uh, with the advent of globalization and technology and then the era uh, post 9-11 of dealing with non-state actors who are capable of causing quite a bit of damage, using technology and globalization as levers <clears throat> to inflict injury upon those that they disagree with or that they hate. Uh, it's said in some ways that when you're dealing with a network, you have to have a network to fight the network. And that is increasingly the world in which we live in, in which it's no longer the case that you outsource the problem or you uh, delegate the problem to the government, still less to the federal government. But rather, it's a partnership that becomes increasingly important in making sure we can secure ourselves. Uh, and even as we look at the evolution of what we've been dealing with in terrorism since September 11th, uh, you know, that was an event which <clears throat> had huge impact. It involved airplanes, technology, uh, although it was technology that was actually essentially taken from us and adapted into a weapon. Uh, and we immediately began to look at the federal government and said, what are you going to do to protect us? Uh, if you remember, the 9-11 Commission report was commissioned to look at federal government failures that may have led to 9-11. But what quickly became apparent is it wasn't going to be something only the federal government could deal with. It was going to require engagement by state and local government as well. And so we began a process of beginning to fund, train, <clears throat> and help planning for state and local government working with the federal government. It was a recognition that under our system, and just as a matter of common sense, the federal government can't be every place and shouldn't be every place. There are some things the federal government does exceptionally well and uniquely, providing air cover, for example, to prevent someone from using an airplane as a weapon. There are some things, though, that work a lot better at the state and local level. Uh, when it's understanding of the community, knowing what your vulnerabilities are in your city or in your state, 
uh, understanding the, the way people interact with each other in your particular part of the country. Those are things which require state and local authorities, and the federal government really is not well positioned to do that. And then we get down even to the level of the individuals. Um, and it's become apparent more and more that if you're really going to have security against terror, that security is going to require the participation and the endorsement of everyday citizens. And I want to spell out a little bit uh, <clears throat> how I think that works. When we talk about the spectrum of security when you deal with terrorism, we tend to talk about three stages uh, in a continuum moving from left to right. Uh, the first stage is identifying the threat and, and uh, seeing what it is that you have to worry about so you can position yourself, hopefully, to prevent it. The second is the actual prevention of the threat, eliminating the threat, apprehending the person carrying out the threat, uh, or somehow disabling the weapon that is the threat. And then the third piece is the recovery, the recognition that when you have an act of terror that does successfully get carried out, if you can mitigate the damage, that can make a huge difference. So obviously, it's been part of what uh, all levels of government have tried to do over the past 10 plus years to try to identify the threat so we can eliminate it. We've done an awful lot to merge the streams of intelligence that were siloed and separated prior to 9-11 in order to make sure they could be properly integrated. Some of this was a structural change. Uh, we put together the National Counterterrorism Center and then actually brought in personnel from the various intelligence agencies to build a culture of sharing so that you didn't have everybody pursuing their own lane. Uh, but beyond simply the institutional structures, there was a, a change in the, in the culture of each agency that began to put an emphasis on the need to share as opposed to the need to know, where the presumption became more, how do we help others by pooling our knowledge rather than how do we protect our turf by keeping our knowledge separate? I'm not going to tell you that uh, this is totally, this transformation is totally complete. I can tell you that uh, from the time I first got involved in dealing with counterterrorism on the day of 9-11 when I was head of the criminal division, up through the present time, I've seen an enormous sea change in the degree of sharing uh, and also in the mindset that people in the intelligence community have about the importance of making sure they're working as a team. But here's what's really interesting. <clears throat> a critical part, again, I'm still focused on the threat part of the spectrum, <clears throat> a critical part of what has been uh, a successful counterterrorism effort over the last decade has been the engagement of regular citizens in the process of helping to identify the threat. You all now see the slogan, see something, say something, which originated, I think, in the New York <clears throat> subway system and then now is branded across the country through the Department of Homeland Security. It turns out to be the case that in, in a large number of terrorism cases, particularly those involving homegrown terrorism, people in the United States or in the United Kingdom or in Europe, who become converted to terrorism and want to carry out attacks, in many of those cases, it is individual citizens who have identified the threat first and prevented it from being carried out. Back, in, I think, in 2007, uh, there was a group that wanted to detonate uh, bombs in front of a nightclub in London, and they ultimately tried to uh, then drive up to Glasgow, Scotland, and detonate a bomb at the airport there. The original discovery <coughs> of the bomb in the car was an individual who saw something funny in the car and called the police, and they were able to disarm it. Same thing happened in the Times Square uh, attempted bombing in 2010, where someone put a, a car bomb together, a, a street merchant saw something funny about that and called the police, and that's how they identified that. The Fort Dix case involving a plot to blow up Fort Dix uh, <clears throat> was uncovered because someone had taken surveillance photographs uh, they had put them in to be developed, and the clerk in the, whatever the drugstore was, thought there was something funny about it and called the police. In each of these cases, <clears throat> but for the vigilance and the willingness of individual citizens to get engaged, to become part of this partnership, uh, there would not have been the ability to uncover the attack. So in the area of, of threat identification, which is the first of the three stages of the continuum of security, we see great examples of how partnership has to work at every level. 
Now we get to the issue of prevention. And there again, it's been a partnership effort. Uh, we know that there are times that the federal government is able to prevent things from happening, either <coughs> by eliminating or capturing terrorist operatives, or keeping them out of the country, uh, or deterring them from getting on a plane because you have security that prevents people from bringing on explosives. And so that's obviously a critical part of the, of the process of prevention. But the state and local government does that too. Most of the actual <clears throat> on the ground security, things that prevent attacks from being carried out are done by your local police and your state police. But even here again, private citizens have played a role. When the Detroit bound underwear bomber in 2009 tried to light his bomb that he had on his person uh, and <clears throat> failed to do so, it was other passengers who jumped on him and prevented him from doing anything more and incapacitated him. We have armed pilots in the cockpit. We've actually enlisted the flight attendants with the rule that when the door opens to the cockpit, they've got to block somebody from coming in. This, again, is the prospect of individual citizens engaged in security. Now, that's, this is not an alibi or an excuse for the government not to do its job, to say, hey, we're not going to expend the effort. It's on you. It's a recognition that the government itself can't do the job by itself. Sure, the government can play a major role. The government can train. It can assist. It can enable. But in the end, it will not do everything unless individual citizens and people get engaged. And finally, on the issue of response, and I want to just take, take a look at what happened on Monday. Um, <clears throat> obviously, at a major sporting event like a marathon, there's always a lot of police security. Um, there is often a federal element of security <clears throat> in a major sporting event, uh, because that's part of a process that the Department of Homeland Security operates. And of course, there are a lot of medical uh, personnel around, because people tend to get um, have, have medical issues arise in the course of a marathon. So you often have a lot of ambulances there. And so in the wake of the explosion, what did we see happen? Well, we saw, like in the iconic picture, the police rushing into the scene to help secure it and minimize the damage. We saw the triage <coughs> crews from the medical um, institutions that were present working feverishly and effectively as best as they could to triage uh, the situation of the victims. And we saw individuals helping each other. And that's part of what the response is about, is that going in and helping to mitigate the damage because people help each other. Uh, it's part of what <coughs> is the only maybe bright side of an event like this, <coughs> which is a reminder of how we all work together as a partnership. And again, no institution, no single person can carry the burden themselves. But to be successful, <coughs> we have to engage every level as part of a partnership. Now that's the, um, you know, obviously what comes to mind because of the events of, of yesterday, but of, of two days ago. But I do want to talk about <coughs> two other areas, <coughs> excuse me, of Homeland Security, in which, again, partnership is critical in resiliency and in response and in dealing with what is a threat. Natural disasters, um, unlike terrorist acts, these have been with us always. And here again, although it's often <clears throat> not understood <clears throat> by members of the public, the doctrine and the policy and the strategy in dealing with natural disasters has never been all about the federal government does it or the state government does it by itself. It's always been a partnership involving multiple levels. And frankly, there's no better illustration of that principle than what happens when it doesn't work. Uh, as as um, Ms. Shoup said, I was uh, Secretary of Homeland Security <clears throat> during Hurricane Katrina. And that was an example of an instance in which the state <clears throat> and local governments were overwhelmed. And because of that, the federal government had to step in and begin the process of trying to deal with an immediate challenge that was not part of what they had normally prepared for. Out of that crisis and that event <clears throat> came an evolution of the doctrine of how we deal with national uh, disasters and emergencies of, of national significance. And again, it was built on partnership. It was done through something that we call the National Response Framework, which is a general architecture for how you allocate responsibility for dealing with natural disasters <clears throat> at every level of government and including the level of individuals. Now, it's not a 
play-by-play -play manual for how you do everything. It's because you can't do that. You have to allow people the discretion to use their common sense. But what it is is a recognition that partnership and integrated planning are critical in order to deal with disasters and similar kinds of events. It can be even a, like a, an epidemic, like an avian flu. Often, these are things you can't prevent. But they are things you can mitigate um, and diminish in terms of consequence if you have everybody engaged in the process. So when you have a hurricane, when you have an earthquake, there's a recognition that everybody has a unique role to play. The federal government obviously will often have assets that are critically important. The ability to surge medical care, uh, transportation, <coughs> security forces in the, in the form of the military as well as FBI and law enforcement agencies. They can bring those to the scene, but that is not the first response. That is a support of the first response. For the first response, we look to the state and local government. They, again, play a unique role because they're on the scene. They understand better than the federal government can what are the requirements and what are the capabilities that can be brought to bear in any location. And every location is different. The geography is different. The culture is different. The particular type of disasters that they deal with are different. And so having that focused uh, responsibility on those who are present and understand the lay of the land becomes a critical part of the doctrine. It's the, it's the local and state governments that provide the National Guard, the firefighters, the police, those who are, who are on the scene in the first instance, <clears throat> who if they're operating properly, should be providing the school buses and the other evacuation equipment and should have the plan for how to house people when they are temporarily displaced. You saw some of that in Sandy when people had to be moved out of areas that were overrun by water or damaged by wind and had to be housed in various locations until they could be st things could be stabilized and they could recover. But even here again, it's about what individuals do. The doctrine, again, not widely understood, of the people in the emergency management community has always been you have to prepare individuals so that they can sustain themselves for 72 hours without help. Because the reality is that the government, even the state and local government, cannot rescue everybody or provide sustenance to everybody within hour one of an event. Sometimes uh, it's physically impossible to get to people. Uh, in Katrina, obviously, you had a flood. That made it extremely difficult. Uh, even in something like Sandy, where there wasn't widespread flooding, there's debris, there are power lines down, there are other natural impediments to getting to people. And of course, what you want to do <clears throat> is to have the people who are maybe incapacitated or ill or children be the initial target of response. So for able-bodied adults who can take care of themselves, having food, having water, having a plan, uh, having a radio, being able to sustain themselves for a period of time is critical not only to make sure they are safe, but in order to make sure that the people in the community who need help can be helped first. Again, you see the principle of partnership leading to resiliency. Having each level of government working together um, with distinct roles, mutually supportive, but nobody simply delegating responsible to anybody else that is the only way you can get a resilient response and mitigate some of the damage. And finally, I'd like to turn to what is the, um, maybe the newest example of an area where partnership is going to become critical in our security and in our resiliency. And that's in the area of cybersecurity. This was not a topic that was discussed a lot um, 10 years ago when we had 9-11. It has been much more in the news now. And I just want to spend a, a couple of minutes talking about what it is we are concerned about when we talk about cybersecurity. You know, we have seen with the advent of the internet and more transactions occurring over the internet that criminals have now found a new way of stealing money and defrauding people. But that's not what I'm talking about here. That's bad, but that is something that is um, largely dealt with by law enforcement and by measures you can take yourself to protect your own assets. We've seen theft of intellectual property. We've seen activists who try to steal information and embarrass people. But the thing that most concerns those in the security community is not those, although those are significant, <clears throat> but it is the possibility of an attack 
that would damage our critical infrastructure and could have a real world consequence that would not only be economically catastrophic, but could result in the loss of life uh, and a lot of injury. Uh, if in fact our water system, our transportation system, our electric grid, uh, other elements of our critical infrastructure went down, that could put people in a position as perilous as a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. And yet here's the challenge in dealing with cybersecurity. Um, the assets and the people who are engaged in cyber activities are largely in private hands. You could not, even if you wanted to, say to the government, we want you to be responsible for taking care of us in the world of cyber. At least you couldn't do it unless you were to prepare to concede to the government the power to basically sit on all of our networks, see everything that goes back and forth, and control everything. And I don't think that would be desirable, and I don't think the American pub public is looking for that. So in a world in which the critical infrastructure that we are trying to protect is in private hands, and the people who operate that are private sector people, there's a role for government, but there's an important role for the private sector as well. And this is what we're seeing in the evolving doctrine of cybersecurity. So what do I mean? When we look at the architecture of cyberspace, where it's often impossible to determine where an attack originates or a threat originates, where it may move around the globe multiple times uh, and hop from point to point before it ultimately reaches its target. Uh, it is maybe more than in any other area of security a team effort in order to prevent that kind of thing from happening and being carried out. Part of it is obviously what, again, the federal government uniquely can provide. That is through the use of intelligence and awareness of what is going on in the world, warning about where some of the threats might be. And there may be some things that, that can be done at the federal level to deter threats, particularly when they emanate from a nation state. But in many cases, much of the information about where threats is coming from is going to arise within networks that are in private hands. If we can bring that information together, we can create a situation where each network owner is not a unique victim experiencing an attack for the first time, but where the sharing of information allows us to warn our other networks about what is going on. In other words, it's the pooling of information among all of these elements of infrastructure that can give us early warning about attacks. Likewise, it is the ability to work in a complementary way among networks that gives us the ability to have resilience if there is an attack. The ability to say that if a particularly critical piece of infrastructure fails because it's been shut off through an attack in cyberspace, having an alternative pathway or multiple alternative pathways to be able to communicate and operate uh, infrastructure becomes a way to be resilient, to, be, to mitigate the damage. Now, this doesn't happen simply by wishing it to be the case. It has to be built into the architecture of our systems going forward. And much of the debate in Washington now and the discussion about what cybersecurity is arises around how do we build an architecture that allows us to deploy a team of everybody in order to make sure we can help warn each other and help support each other in the face of cyber threats to our critical infrastructure. Now, it's not going to be easy because it does require um, people to take on responsibility for security that they may feel is unfairly burdensome on them. You know, one of the particular characteristics of cyberspace is it's interdependent. Uh, if something fails in one area, the cost and the impact is not necessarily felt only by that particular piece of infrastructure, but it has a cascading or a ripple effect uh, all over the entire country. Uh, I'll give you an example actually from the physical world. In 2005, there was a hurricane in Miami called Hurricane Rita. It was actually, I think, a, maybe a Category 4, and it was the biggest hurricane of that year. It was actually bigger than Katrina and more powerful. And it headed into Miami. And Florida, which is, is, um, has a very, very well-developed uh, plan for dealing with hurricanes, not surprisingly, had prepared itself for this hurricane very well. They had food, extra food, extra water in the grocery stores. They had accumulated uh, in, in the refineries and in, in tanks extra fuel so they could quickly fuel up and get things moving again. The idea was they would take the impact of the storm, they would hunker down, and they, they would immediately begin to respond 
and, and revive. But when the storm came and went, <clears throat> they found things weren't starting up again. And I was actually down there for this uh, hurricane. And we were saying, well, why is it that when we have all the supplies we need, the storm is passed, it's now calm, why are things not starting up again? And as we looked at what was going on, we discovered the following um, maybe unpredictable, maybe predictable artifact. Yes, it's true there were a lot of supplies, but to get to the supplies, to get to the grocery store, to get to, to some other necessary place, you needed to be able to drive. In order to drive, you need to be able to get gas in your car. And uh, to get the gas pumping, you had to have electricity. But the problem is that people couldn't get to the electric power plants because they couldn't gas the car up, and therefore it was slow to get the electricity started. So the question was, well, why can't the gas stations have some ability to pump from generators? Then people could get gas in the tank, we could start the regular power plants up, and everything would be up and running. And as we looked into this issue, we discovered that for a very large number of gas station owners, it wasn't economically sensible for them to invest in a generator. They said, hey, look, if I lose two or three days of business, it's not that much money for me. I'll make it back anyway. And so why should I put money into a generator when, from a cost-benefit standpoint, it's more cost than benefit? The problem is, it's a cost to everybody else, and everybody else pays the price. The, the punchline is eventually the state of Florida passed a law that requires most gas stations to have a generator as a condition of getting licensed. In a small way, that's an example of interdependence, which applied to cyberspace could become much, much more consequential. If a cyber attack took down power plants and you didn't have the ability to bring other critical infrastructure up or uh, to, to remediate it quickly, you would start to see cascading effects in the grocery store, in the hospital, in your transportation system. And so sometimes the responsibility to your fellow citizens can't simply be weighed in terms of a cost-benefit analysis about what it means to you personally. It has to be looking at the broader community and the broader team. And that is, in many ways, the most dramatic and vivid example of why teamwork is essential to resiliency. The good news is, I think, that we have learned a lot over the last 10 years. And we've learned sometimes through difficult lessons. 9-11 uh, taught us the lesson of the importance of sharing information. Uh, Katrina taught us the le lesson of being able to backstop a failure um, at a different level of government. And it also reinforced the lesson that people have to be prepared to help themselves to some degree, particularly if we're to focus on rescuing those who are most at risk and least capable and, and creating the space in which to do that. And cyber teaches us that interdependence and the need to work as a team is even more intense in a world now where interdependence is a characteristic of almost everything we do in business, in our personal relations, whether we're transporting ourselves, whether we're heating, we're heating ourselves, or getting necessary food and water in which to live. Through these lessons, um, the urgency and, frankly, the capability and the plan to build teamwork and resiliency has been refined. And you know, as tragic as Monday was, um, some of the bright spots is to look at how effectively federal and state authorities have worked um, to begin to respond and to try to find the perpetrator. This is the payoff of 10 years of investment, hundreds of millions of dollars, even in the city of Boston, building capability, uh, exercises, teamwork, joint planning that has broken down the barriers that would have existed 20 years ago. And at another level, we've seen um, how people have picked themselves up and continued to finish the race. They've done it literally and they've done it metaphorically. And that's also an important part of teamwork. In the end, resiliency is important not because it's an excuse not to stop terrorist attacks or to be vigorous in pursuing terrorists. I'm the first person who will tell you that uh, the best outcome in terms of preventing terrorism is to eliminate the terrorists before the terrorist attacks and to stop them from getting their weapons in place. But we will not succeed 100% of the time. And recognizing that and building a layer of resiliency and hardening our vulnerability so that we can reduce the impact of an attack 
is equally important in having a security strategy. And it's going to apply whether it's terrorism, whether it's a natural disaster that, that comes up out of the blue, or whether in the world of, of new world of cyber, it's something that comes across wire and wireless transmission as opposed to real life in, with bombs, with nails and, and, and pellets. So this is, a, I think, a, a timely issue to reflect upon. Uh, I know you join me in uh, wishing uh, the very best recovery for those who are currently uh, suffering in, um, in Boston, uh, hoping that our law enforcement folks can speedily find the perpetrator or perpetrators, and re remembering that it's important to stay vigilant, but that vigilance, we shouldn't lapse into hypervigilance or panic, nor should we become fatalistic and believe we can't do anything. We can do a lot. We can do a lot if we work together. And we also have to recognize that sometimes, even when we fail, our teamwork and our working together will help to help us arise more quickly from the consequences of, of a terrible event. So with that, I'm delighted to take some questions. I want to ask you on, uh, two natural disaster questions. Uh, my understanding is it's only a matter of time when an asteroid uh, large enough to cause damage, I think one blew up over Siberia recently, uh, is going to be heading to the Earth. And question number one is, can you explain to us what national or international cooperation and planning is there? Presumably, there are ways by which we could send missiles up and try to deflect its path, but I don't know the progress of that. That's question number one. Question number two is, it is my understanding that lower Manhattan was severely flooded yeah. uh, with a Sandy, and what I read was that, in fact, they, uh, the city of New York, with increasing uh, melting of the ice caps, uh, is going to be at risk. And uh, they, what I've read is that the uh, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Holland, they have giant uh, uh, flood doors that they can manage. And a project of that magnitude really needs to be done if you're going to protect Manhattan. And I, and I wondered what's the state of that? Because my concern is these are both such large things uh, that the same thing will happen like Katrina. I read in the National Geographic 10 years before, exactly what happened was predicted. And we all know what happened. So I, I can't tell you what the state of planning on asteroids were. I, I used to have to deal with a lot of things as Secretary of Homeland Security. Actually, asteroids was not in my domain. <laughs> I, I think that's probably the Department of Defense. Um, and I, I, I think they're pretty good at tracking you know, when asteroids are, are, might come close. And I think normally, uh, we're talking about things that occur over periods of five or 10,000 years. So that may be a time horizon a little bit beyond my ability to imagine. Um, I do think it, you know, it, it's always hard to balance in terms of very um, low probability events with very catastrophic uh, impacts. There's a tendency to discount those. And um, it's easy to say, well, if it hasn't happened already, it won't happen again. And that's a fallacy in the way you think about those things. Uh, but I will, you know, you talk about the issue of um, floodgates, like in Amsterdam. And I will tell you a story that, that an exp uh, it actually did happen that illustrates the difficulty sometimes even of doing something that you should do. So why is it that the uh, Katrina had such a negative impact on New Orleans? The storm itself did not hit New Orleans directly. It was to the east. It, it, by the time it hit, it was not that powerful a storm. It was not a big storm surge coming off the ocean like you had in parts of Mississippi. <clears throat> what happened is there was a collapse of a wall at, the se at 17th Street that because parts of New Orleans are below sea level allowed basically Lake Pontchartrain to drain into that bowl. So um, when we were dealing with um, the aftermath of Katrina, one of the questions was <clears throat> why did the wall collapse? And there were some engineering problems about the wall. But that wasn't unforeseen. If you look at the geography of, of New Orleans, what you see is the canal is a narrow a channel <clears throat> that reaches into the lake. At the mouth of the channel, uh, people had said years before 
years before Katrina, if you built the gate and you dropped the gate, then what would happen is, <coughs> as the storm pushed, come us, the wind comes off the sea, pushes the water to the north part of the lake. As it comes back down, instead of being forced like a funnel into the canal, the 17th Street Canal, it would simply be stopped at the gate. And that would be an easy fix. And it is true that that would have stopped the water from funneling into that canal with a increased water pressure, and there wouldn't have been a collapse of the wall, and there would not have been that huge disaster. So I asked the question, well, that seems like a pretty sensible solution. Why didn't they build the gate and drop it? And the answer is that when they talked about doing it, some of the people living along the lake said, we don't like that because it's going to spoil the view. It's going to be ugly. And so they didn't build it. And the consequence was when the storm pushed the water to the north edge of the lake and the wind passed, the water came rushing back, and then it funneled with great force into the uh, canal, and it, it took the wall down. Now, here's a lesson learned. In, uh, in the wake of that, they did build that gate. And in Hurricane Gustav, which also uh, was aimed at New Orleans and wound up landing a little bit to the west of New Orleans, um, as soon as the hurricane approached, they dropped the gate. The water pushed into Lake, pa uh, the wind pushed into Lake Pontchartrain, it went north, came back south, hit the wall, hit the gate, and nothing happened. That's a great lesson learned. It's a problem that it didn't get learned before Katrina. But here's the point. It wasn't a lack of foresight. It was someone didn't want to have the willpower to do it, or they thought it spoiled the aesthetics. Um, that is actually not teamwork. That's looking out for yourself and not looking out for everybody else. So maybe that's you know, the, my takeaway in terms of, of the kinds of issues you're raising about, about Manhattan. Yes? Mr. Secretary, <coughs> um, my name is Bill Courtney. I'm with CSE. Thanks for your terrific remarks tonight. For an ordinary American, what can they do to protect themselves against cyber attacks? Is it just a matter of antivirus protection and not opening suspicious <coughs> attachments, or are there other measures that they can take? That is, uh, um, as Jim Carrefano knows, that is a lecture in and of itself. Uh, but I, I, let me kind of give you a short message on this. I, I've come to think one of the biggest problems in cybersecurity is that the, uh, it's been mystified by having a lot of people talk about it in very technical terms. And so for the average non-engineering person, they kind of throw their hands up and they say, I can't do anything about this. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a geek. I'm not someone who's knowledgeable in writing code, so I'm just not going to do anything about it. Uh, in fact, there are a lot of things that can be done that won't totally eliminate the risk for the average person, but can really reduce it. Obviously, a lot of it is upgrades and, and firewalls and protections you can put on the network um, that will, they won't eliminate everything, but they'll eliminate a lot of, a lot of stuff. But if you, particularly if you run a business or an enterprise, many of the worst intrusions have occurred because of human error or human failing. For example, not understanding uh, that you have to be careful about what links you open or what you download when an email comes or you go to a website. Um, and, and this notion of cyber hygiene is important. Not, for example, when someone gives you a thumb drive, you get, you know, you get in like a, a bag of goodies when you go to an event, not just saying, oh, a thumb drive and sticking it into your, uh, into your laptop or your PC and thereby introducing some malware. There was a piece in the um, magazine Foreign Affairs about five years ago that uh, Bill Lynn, who was then the Deputy Secretary of Defense, wrote, in which he disclosed the fact <clears throat> that one of the most serious intrusions into the defense network um, had occurred when an officer picked up a, a USB stick, put it into his laptop, and thereby introduced malware from a foreign source that ultimately was used to penetrate the network. So I always say to people, if you don't really know who provided the, the, um, the thumb drive uh, or the USB stick to you, uh, and you don't know what's on it, you have no business putting it into your computer. It's a little bit like walking down the street and seeing a hamburger lying on the sidewalk and saying, oh, a hamburger, I'm going to eat it. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Um, but so those are simple things. They're not technical. That if you understand them, you can really reduce the risk with respect to cyber. There are no geographic boundaries to cyber risk, there, which means other countries are having to struggle with it. We're allies with many. What, what are the other countries doing, and can we learn, or are we learning <clears throat> from what they're doing to, to fight the same challenge? 
You know, I, th I think there is unevenness in what other countries are doing. Now, we do work closely with our allies on cyber issues. Um, the more challenging problem is there are some countries which have a different view of what the rules of cyber are than we do. It's not an accident. There's been a report published, um, I guess, about a month ago by Mandiant that analyzed a particular set of cyber attacks and I think made a very compelling case uh, that it emanated from a particular location in China that was supported by the People's Liberation Army. So it was an official set of attacks. And they had linguists and uh, a whole lot of support. And the purpose of these attacks was to steal intellectual property, plans, um, technology, things of that sort. Although I should say that when you introduce a malicious tool into a network, sometimes it, does, it can do more than simply steal things. It can also can do some damage. Um, the U.S. government has raised uh, complaints with the Chinese about it. The Chinese um, often deny that it's them. Deniability is a, is a real feature of cyber attacks because it's often hard to prove who's actually responsible. Um, but that poses an, a problem because it's hard to get agreement internationally if there's not a fundamental common understanding of what is appropriate behavior and what's inappropriate behavior. There are probably some things we could get agreement on. Um, I don't think, for example, the Chinese are interested in stealing your credit card. So uh, with respect to certain types of, of, of criminality, we probably could get some agreements. The flip side is there are some countries who regard a cyber attack as including someone um, sending ideas that you know, the regime doesn't like. And we wouldn't ever sign on to a regime of cybersecurity that said you can censor you know, ideas that are unpleasant. So um, this is maybe one of the most challenging areas in which international cooperation uh, um, could occur. I think we are moving slowly towards some degrees of cooperation. I would caution against the belief that we're going to get there quickly or that you're going to get a level of cooperation that's as comprehensive as what we've done, for example, in the nonproliferation area, where you have a pretty broad consensus um, among most countries about what, what should be done in, about proliferation. Going to your point about collaboration between the government and the public, I think something that occurred after Boston is an excellent example. Uh, they put out a call for picant or f f photo intelligence and were immediately deluged by photos, videos, so on and so forth, which they've been using, I guess, to piece together yeah. uh, what, what they know. Um, it's possible that when you call on the public to help, you'll get more help than what you know what to do with. Yeah. Um, could you speak to the issue of how the government can more <coughs> effectively marshal the resources of many people who want to give their aid? Yeah. That's a great question because uh, people often don't think about that problem of more help than you need. So in the wake of Katrina, everybody wanted to give stuff. The problem is you don't necessarily need you know, 100,000 rafts. And you don't want to disappoint people, but uh, it becomes almost burdensome when a huge amount of material flows in. We eventually actually went to a, a firm that was able to create uh, an online site where if you wanted to give something other than money, you could get on the site and it would connect you up with people who were looking for something. So there is, uh, in, in some of the modern technology, a way around. It's kind of like, it was like an eBay for disaster relief. And I, I think they still have it. So that's a great, a great way in which you can marshal things. Um, uh, another way you can marshal things, again, is as you point out, Twitter, Facebook, other kinds of media can be very helpful in helping to identify where there are needs or where there are problems. At the same time, if you get false data and too much data, it becomes very difficult to reconcile. I suspect, um, and again, this, these developments occurred after I left office, but if it were up to me, I would be looking for a way to um, accumulate all this information but have an, a data mining and algorithmic capability that would allow you to filter out what looked to be erroneous or, or outlying messages in order to focus on what looks to be, you know, kind of things that are real. And there's a way to do that if you take a lot of data together. Um, so as with anything else, there are ways to use these tools and one of the lessons of, of modern data management is you can be quite effective in using a lot of the data, but you do have to think about it in advance. It doesn't work if you think about it on the day of, but that's, that's a great question. What 
Could you elaborate on what you saw as lessons learned from Hurricane Katrina, which were then applied to the New York, New Jersey area following uh, Superstorm Sandy? And second, is there anything that you have seen from the tsunami that struck Japan that the United States has taken notice of and is adopting or working with the Japanese government to understand? <coughs> Well, I'm a little handicapped in that both of the, the, the tsunami and the uh, and Sandy occurred after office, so I only have kind of the vision from outside. Um, with respect to the first issue, um, I can maybe speak a little more particularly about Hurricane Gustav, which came in 2008, which hit New Orleans, and in a way was kind of a uh, like a test, you know, after we learned the lessons in Katrina to see whether they actually worked, and the key major element of difference. The reason Gustav resulted in no real serious impact, I mean, there was a lot of property damage, but not a lot, of, not, not significant loss of life, was planning. The key lesson of Katrina was the federal government had not planned with the state and local governments to step in or support in the way that would be necessary if there was a major catastrophic event. And that also meant that the federal government had not built a kind of a backstopping capability. So one of the tragic things in Katrina was there were a lot of hospitals in New Orleans that had, they were, they had their generators on a level that could be flooded. There were a lot of nursing homes, and they didn't have the ability, the nursing homes didn't have the ability to bring people out, or they, had, they assumed they were going to shelter in place, and then they made the decision too late, and they, people wound up getting, getting killed. Um, so in the wake of that, we were, the federal government worked with the state and local communities to build a plan and build some capabilities. We did, for example, a, a census of all the nursing homes. So we knew that if a hurricane came, there would be a way of checking to make sure every single nursing home had evacuated or had a very good plan to, to shelter in place. Uh, we did the same thing with hospitals. We People moved their generators to a higher floor. Uh, in fact, when Gustav came, uh, we had a seamless evacuation. We had a plan in place to get everybody out. <clears throat> we had places for them to go. People knew where they should go. There was one hospital that decided to shelter in place, and at the last minute, they changed their mind and said, no, we can't. We're going to be at risk. But because of the planning, we were able to get the National Guard and the military to move airframes into place, and even within a matter of hours, get everybody out of that hospital into aircraft and get them out of there. So that was a great example of the lesson learned. And I think you've seen that carry forward with, with Hurricane Sandy. Now, you know, to kind of paraphrase Tolstoy, you know, no two storms are alike. Every, every storm is unhappy in its own way. But there are some common lessons about planning. Um, in terms of, of the experience of Japan, I think there, there'll be some lessons learned about planning with respect to how you site certain kinds of infrastructure. But I think what's been remarkable is the Japanese resiliency of spirit and the fact that there was a lot of courage and a lot of response and, and self-reliance. Um, and I think the Japanese will learn some things. I know there was a study done by the uh, Diet of, of um, how you do some pl better planning and better preparation for these kinds of events. Uh, hopefully, you know, when a disaster occurs for the first time, in a way, it's understandable that you're taken by surprise. But we shouldn't let the same thing happen more than once, because then it's shame on us we haven't learned the lessons. Mr. Secretary, thank you for your excellent remarks tonight. Just wanted to ask you about uh, cybersecurity has garnered a lot of attention, <laughs> rightly so. Do you feel as though it's coming at a potential deficit of our attention on critical infrastructure and how we pay attention to our railways <coughs> and seaports and such, um, as well as the border? Well, you know, you're, the problem is you're always competing for attention. Um, I actually think if you look, we've done quite a bit to secure our critical infrastructure physically. Um, I'm not saying that the job is done, and there are different challenges depending on whether you're talking about railroads or buses or, or different kinds of plants. But um, we spent a fair amount of, of effort planning uh, for critical infrastructure. We have in place um, institutions that are capable of monitoring and conveying information about threats. We've done some training, and, and we've made, made a lot of investment. Cyber, I think, really, um, partly because it's grown so quickly, has lagged a little bit. We started in 2007 
uh, by putting together the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative, uh, which the current administration continued on and, and built upon. Um, so we're, we're beginning to catch up, but I still think in terms of relative risk and degree of vulnerability, and uh, cyber is still probably now still the greatest unmet need. The other one area I'd like to see us make more progress on is uh, biosecurity. Um, I think we have the capability to have countermeasures for most kinds of biological attacks. We have not put in place all of the institutions we need to get the countermeasures out to people uh, as quickly as possible. It's, by the way, very easy to do. This is another failure of will. Um, so I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Anybody from the FDA in the audience? <laughs> I'm about to kick the FDA. Um, when I was in office, we um, talked about the possibility of distributing the kind of major countermeasures um, and having them available for people to have in their homes, things like Cipro and, and things of that sort, or at least to have them distributed to firehouses and schools and whatnot to have them available. And uh, the, the um, uh, FDA said, well, you can't do that because these are prescription drugs and you can't give people those drugs without a prescription. And they're going to be misused and people will sell them, et cetera. So they ran a pilot program in a couple of communities. And they gave them out. And then a year later, they came back. And they went to see, did people still have the countermeasures? And something like 97 or 98% still had them. They hadn't misused them. So the secretary of HHS came back. And we had a meeting with the president and said, you know, look, the results are in. It's great. And it's like, great, let's do it. And, oh, can't do it. FDA says, no, you still need to show that you have to have a doctor who will have had to make a decision to prescribe. Well, the problem is this. If you have an attack of anthrax, you've got maybe, maybe, maybe 24 hours to get a countermeasure between the time you experience it and the time it's too late. You are not going to get prescriptions for, you know, 10 million people in 24 hours. So to me, this is a, um, a failure of will. It's a, it's a triumph of kind of petty foggery over common sense. Um, even if you don't want to put them in individual hands, there's no reason you couldn't have every firehouse around the country have a stock of this stuff so that you could then, for each community, get them distributed within 24 hours. Now, would there be probably some people who'd have a negative reaction and might, might in fact, have, have serious side effects? Yeah. And another problem is when we make decisions not based upon what is going to be the way to save the most people, but worrying about if someone winds up with a side effect, there's going to be a lawsuit afterwards. So there are things we, you know, there are things that are hard problems, and there are things that are easy problems. And the easy problems are the ones that we could solve if we simply decided to use common sense sometimes. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.